Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Diodoma, the wise ancient woman who Socrates as a young man is studying with about love, promises to initiate him into the deeper mysteries of love. And here, in this topic, we're going to see her doing precisely that. Socrates has confessed his ignorance. He is now ready to learn something deeper about the nature of love itself. And Diodema begins by talking about us all being poets. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, why is that important? Well, because something that's involved in poetry or any sort of making, any sort of production, is a desire for the good. Every desire that we have, ultimately, is for some sort of good or even that thing that we call happiness. And so love desires the good, and it can steer us in a lot of different pathways. Let's actually take a look at some of the examples that she gives of poetry. She says, um, we use the word for the people who engage in rhyme and meter. If I say poet, you might actually think about somebody sitting around a coffee house, um, you know, doing poetry slams, probably somebody who's fairly, you know, um, fairly different than most of the other people, particularly in the way they dress or affectations. Uh, you know, let's say we put aside the sort of pejorative notion of poet, and we talk about great poetry. Um, it's still something that we consider to be purely literary. And even if we extend it to the cultural sphere and we say, well, look, you know, the Greek dramatic poets were the forerunners of our film industry or things like that, it's still a limited segment of society. Diodema says that, in a certain sense, everybody's a poet. He says, we give various names to the various arts. We call one poetry, but there's all these other arts that are tied in with it as well. Business, athletics, philosophy. Um, we don't call these people poets, but they really are. Why? Because they're involved in some sort of process of making, some sort of production, some sort of seeking. They are all motivated by some sort of desire, some sort of love for the good. And they visualize or they represent the good in different ways. So the person who's in finance and is devoted to making money, that's in part because they think that that is actually going to make them happy or make their family happy, if that matters to them, or get them prestige, if that's what matters to them. All of them are involved in some process of seeking, making, loving, doing. And so love, love really desires to possess the good forever. It desires the good not in a way that can be satisfied at a particular point in time or even a number of different points in time. It wants the good to be its own, its possession, for as long as the, the desirer is going to exist. We could say for eternity, if the desirer thinks of themselves as existing in eternity. You might say our desire extends itself beyond the purely uh, present, the, even the realm of countable time and space to encompass the all, the, the, the eternal. So love desires to possess the good forever. And Socrates can understand this. This fits in with the, the sort of moral perspective that he has and many other philosophers have. But now he gets sort of stuck and Diodema has to help him out. So she says, well, what, is, what does that lead to? How does this take place? Um, he says, uh, she, she says, um, love really des desires to bring forth, to bring to birth 
to produce a kind of, of progeny upon or in the beautiful. That's the secret message that, that's there, she says. We're not actually looking for our other half. We're looking for a unity that surpasses that. And we can only do that within something that is beautiful. So Socrates says, that's really deep. I don't understand what you're talking about. And she says, I'll try to explain it a little bit more plainly. She says, we're all of us fertile, prolific in body and in soul. And when we reach a certain age, this takes the form of sexual desire, a desire to engage in reproduction. So if we go over now, now and look at here, we can talk about birth in the body. We have a desire to have sex, and it's not just a desire to engage in pleasure or make a need go away, or even, you know, we can think of other things that draw people in, you know, a need for social approval or approval of that one person. There's something deeper going on there. And what Diotima says that it is, is something that she says goes on within the whole of, of the, the realm that reproduces itself. What we want is a sort of limited immortality. Animals reproduce themselves and therefore reproduce their kind, their species. They make more new animals, right? And they don't look exactly like them and they don't have exactly the same temperaments. They are different kinds of beings, but they're not radically different. So, you know, cats make a whole bunch of kittens. Pu dogs make a whole bunch of puppies. Elephants make, I think, calves is, is what they call them, right? And we can go on with that. Human beings... Likewise, those who are, as she says, pregnant in the body, she's thinking about men, by the way, as being pregnant and wanting to, you know, in the sexual act, uh, sort of transfer that pregnancy to the woman who is going to bring that, that to, to, to gestation. She says, men who are pregnant in the body seek out women and they have sex with them and they produce little kids and that produces a family and hopefully that family leaves behind, you know, replacements for the ones who die and also continues the family name, continues other things about them, continues the mannerisms, continues the projects. It's an attempt to have a kind of immortality. And this makes a lot of sense because both in ancient Greece and in our own day, we often see parents investing so much of themselves and their dreams and hopes in their children, often when their dreams and hopes have failed too, by the way. Um, they, they get hyper aware of the, the possibility of passing it on to their kids, right? This can turn into a problem. Now, this isn't the end of the story, though, and there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Another point that we should actually stress is that Diotima has this digression about the nature of knowledge as well. She's not attempting to provide a complete epistemology at this point. This is just an example. But she says, think about the thoughts in your head. Think about the knowledge that you have. Does it remain constant forever, like it's burned into your brain as if you're, she doesn't have this example, but think about it this way, as if you're sort of like a motherboard that has everything fused in. No, you've got all of this knowledge and bits and pieces of it are ebbing away as you, as you hear this right now, and you've got to work to put those back in there. That's why we lose skills over time. That's why if we haven't read a book for a long time, we forget exactly what happened in the story, and we mix characters up and things like that. We need to refresh that. That is a, a, an attempt to try to in, in, introduce a stability, a fixity into what is often shifting. And that's the, the nature of human knowledge, unfortunately. And that's also the nature of physical beings. You know, you can't keep the body in exactly the same state. I mean, think about it. They, they didn't know the cellular biology at that time. But the entire body is constantly in flux and change. There's not a single cell in your body, so, so you know, the scientists tell us, that was living, you know, at the time that you were born. So maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe eggs are that way. But most of them are completely new cells. Right? So that's the way it works with the body. There's this process of reproduction. People who are pregnant in the body produce more kids. That's wonderful, but that's not as high as love can go. That's the lesser understanding of love. That's the lesser activity of love. That's the lesser poetry of love. Those who are pregnant in the soul, those who are attracted to higher things that are not merely of the body, 
have the potential for a immortality that's not merely having a repetition of the same or the similar, but they can tie themselves in with eternity in a real, tangible way, according to Plato. Those who are pregnant in the soul, they bring forth something different as their product, as their poetry. They bring forth wisdom and the other virtues. And she has a description here of how this actually works for the young person who becomes aware of this. Think about puberty, right? Puberty is a time of great upheaval in your life, or at least it should be if you're having normal reactions, uh, because you get flooded with all these hormones, and some of those hormones say, you know, let's fall in love, let's have sex, let's do this, let's do that. Um, some people are attracted to things that are higher, to things that are greater, deeper, more encompassing. So she says, the, um, here we go, if any man is so closely allied to the divine to be teeming with these virtues, to have brought forth these virtues in his youth, when he comes to manhood, his first ambition is to be beginning to reproduce, you can be sure he will go about in search of the loveliness on which he may beget. Now, what kind of loveliness is that going to be? A loveliness of the soul, not a loveliness of the body. It is attracted by a beautiful body, but if he finds a soul that's beautiful, distinguished, and agreeable, he's so charmed to find so welcome an alliance. It will be easy for him to talk of virtue to such a listener and to dis discuss what human goodness is and how the virtuous should live, to undertake the other's education, the other's upbringing. Just like the, those who are pregnant in the body have to raise their children, something similar happens in friendships or in the love relationship that has been talked about you know, in, in this. We might think about Diotima as doing something similar to this with Socrates, although it's just hinted at there, isn't it? In any case, it leads to these friendships that can be completely stable friendships over the course of a lifetime in which people are growing together. These are things that will not be completely um, understandable to those who are on this level. They'll be like, why are you hanging out with that person? They're not very attractive. They don't have a lot of money. They can't really open doors for you. And you say, well, they're, they're a really great person. I like the kind of person that I am with them. I'm becoming a better person by being with them. Some people are just aren't going to get that. People who are able to get that have the potential to be up here. Perhaps, I guess, the tragic thing is that so many um, have that potential and, and don't do anything with it. Now, Socrates, or rather Diotima, goes on, uh, Socrates is narrating, Diotima is talking in this, to tell us about um, two greater ways in which uh, the soul can be pregnant and bring forth amazing, wonderful uh, not just life-changing, but world-changing uh, children. She talks about the poets. She brings up Homer and Hesiod. And just think about how many other authors we have that we, you know, look to and say, you know, in a certain sense, the world is different after the publication of their works, um, you know, because of the depth, because of the profundity of them. I mean, Homer is one of them. Hesiod, uh, I'm a little bit iffy on him, but... Um, Think about Dostoevsky. Think about Solzhenitsyn, you know, after the publication of the Gulag Archipelago, uh, which isn't intended to be a work of beauty. There's something that's changed. Think about the works of Plato himself. Think about Aristotle. Think about all these, these, these people that we can compare. Not all men, by the way. Think about, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft is a particularly good example of a woman who does some interesting things in these respects. In any case, the poets, the, the producers of cultural artifacts, we could say, the producers of the things that mirror the world and show us ourselves, they produce immortal children, Diotima says. And then, even more important than them, according to Plato, according to Diotima, according to Socrates, are the lawgivers. They bring forth spiritual children as well. But their spiritual children are not just virtues, not just you know, you know, arrangements of, of poetic verse or something like that. 
They do their artwork within the fabric of society itself with the laws, with the constitutions under which people live, with the entire society as their canvas, as their marble on which they work. And Plato, you know, suggests to us who would not want to be the, the person coupled with one of these people and help bring forth beautiful, great, uh, world-changing children like that. This is so much higher than the mere reproduction, even, you know, with family affection, even with all the other things that go along with that, that happens at the level of the body. So all of this is, is what Diotima is calling one of the greater mysteries of love. In loving, we become poets. We want to bring forth something. We want to create. That's what really lies at the heart of love.